Nietzsche's adult life was defined by the politics of Bismarck. Bismarck defeated Denmark, Austria and France and achieved his goal of unifying Germany. And Nietzsche played a role in this unification process, serving as a medical orderly in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. And yet he was critical of Bismarck and German nationalism. Whilst discussing the Germany of his era, Nietzsche said, If you invest all your energy in economics, world commerce, parliamentarianism, military engagements, power, and power politics, if you take the quantum of intelligence, seriousness, will, and self-overcoming that you embody and expend it all in this one direction, then there won't be any left for any other direction. Culture and the state. Let us be honest with ourselves. These are adversaries. Nietzsche's central concern was not with unifying Germany or strengthening its military, but with creating the conditions for high culture. According to Nietzsche, the highest culture that had ever existed was ancient Greece. During the Franco-Prussian War, his thoughts were with Athens rather than Germany. One year after the unification was achieved, he published his first book, The Birth of Tragedy. The Birth of Tragedy explored classical Athenian drama, a form of art that combined all its expressions such as dance, tone, and poetry. When he reissued the book in 1886, he drew a clear parallel between the Franco-Prussian War and the composition of the book. To quote him, While the thunder of the Battle of Worth rolled across Europe, the brooder and lover of riddles who fathered the book was sitting in some corner of the Alps, utterly preoccupied with his ponderings and riddles, and consequently very troubled and untroubled at one and the same time writing down his thoughts about the Greeks. In The Birth of Tragedy, Nietzsche argued that it is only as an aesthetic phenomenon that existence and the world are eternally justified. In other words, only high culture makes human existence worthwhile. The state, for Nietzsche, is justified because it opens up a space within which culture can for the first time flourish. A flourishing culture justifies both the state and the people's lives within it, when culture ceases to flourish, people begin to experience life as a meaningless absurdity. What does a polis need to do in order to produce high culture? Nietzsche turned to the Greeks for the answer to this question. The Greeks, from as early as we can tell, were stratified into a conquering and a conquered people, an aristocratic element and a serf-like element. Nietzsche believes that high culture necessitates this hierarchical arrangement. In his work, The Greek State, he writes... In order that there may be a broad, deep, and fruitful soil for the development of art, the enormous majority must, in the service of a minority, be slavishly subjected to life's struggle, to a greater degree than their own wants necessitate. At their cost, through the surplus of their labor, that privileged class is to be relieved from the struggle for existence, in order to create and to satisfy a new world of want. In other words, high art necessitates a rigid class structure. The lower class provides the upper class with its means of existence so that it can freely devote itself to artistic pursuits. To quote Nietzsche once again, We should not surrender to humanitarian illusions. Truth is hard. So, without further consideration, let's admit to ourselves how up to this point every higher culture on earth has started. People with a still natural nature, barbarians in every dreadful sense of the word, Predatory men, still in possession of an unbroken power of the will and a desire for power, threw themselves on a weaker, more civilized people. Put differently, aristocratic morality, in the most barbaric sense of the word, is what leads to high culture. In order to fully appreciate this point, we must take a closer look at aristocracy. Aristocracies emerge when a tribe is conquered and subdued by a foreign elite. Typically, the foreign elite are pastoralists, whilst the uh, conquered tribe are farmers. Pastoralists raise and herd livestock, whilst farmers work the land. For example, China has been controlled by pastoralists for most of the last millennium. The native Han have been subject to rule by Jurchen, Manchu or Mongol pastoralists from the steppe. The only time the native population of China has ruled itself was during the Ming Dynasty. What explains this phenomenon? How were a small group of steppe pastoralists able to conquer and subdue a large nation? Some believe it can be explained by the diet of the pastoralists. In Jack Weatherboard's book, Genghis Khan and the Making of the Modern World, he writes, 
The Chinese noted with surprise and disgust the ability of the Mongol warriors to survive on little food and water for long periods. According to one, the entire army could camp without a single puff of smoke since they needed no fires to cook. Compared to the Chinese soldiers, the Mongols were much healthier and stronger. The Mongols consumed a steady diet of meat, milk, yogurt, and other dairy products, and they fought men who lived on gruel made from various grains. The grain diet of the peasant warriors stunted their bones, rotted their teeth, and left them weak and prone to disease. In contrast, the poorest Mongol soldier ate mostly protein, thereby giving him strong teeth and bones. Unlike the Chinese soldiers, who were dependent on a heavy carbohydrate diet, the Mongols could more easily go a day or two without food. Weatherboard's observations about Chinese peasants apply to early farmers more broadly. Farming populations tend to be lactose intolerant. Thus, they can only receive protein and calcium from a limited number of sources. As a consequence, they tend to be smaller and have less robust skeletons than pastoralists, who enjoy advantages in height, strength, and overall health. Other writers believe the dominance of pastoral people can be explained by their way of life. Pastoralists spend their time on the move, often in unhospitable terrain, such as mountains and hills. Such a life encourages the development of physical and moral qualities that are conducive to conquest. Furthermore, the pastoralist's assets have feet that can be led away in an eye blink. The pastoralist is, therefore, always at risk of being robbed. Cattle raids are a common feature of his existence. For this reason, he must develop a capacity for violence. The development of these warlike qualities enables the pastoralist to conquer a settled farming population. After the conquest takes place, the farmers are reduced to the status of serfs, who the pastoralists parasitically live off. In other words, the pastoralists become a class of people who are relieved from the perpetual struggle for bare subsistence. Today, we call these people aristocrats. Understanding the pastoral origins of aristocracy can help us understand aristocratic morality. Aristocrats are centrally concerned with family lineage and stock. This concern can be explained by their pastoralist origins. Pastoralists are sensitive to the principles of animal husbandry. They understand that herd or specimen quality can be improved through training and selective breeding. The tradition of animal breeding remained popular among aristocrats long after they had conquered foreign lands. Thus, we find that Greek aristocrats in Plato's time enjoyed the selective breeding of sporting and ornamental animals. It was one of the characteristic hobbies of Athenian gentlemen. Glaucon, Plato's brother, was an aristocrat and enthusiastic breeder of animals. In the Republic, Plato asks Glaucon about the breeding process. The conversation goes as follows. Do you then breed from all indiscriminately, or are you careful to breed from the best? From the best. And again, do you breed from the youngest or the oldest, or, so far as may be, from those in their prime? From those in their prime. And if they are not thus bred, you expect, do you not, that your birds breed and hounds will greatly degenerate? Likewise, the Greek aristocrat, military leader, and student of Socrates, Xenophon, had a fascination with breeding animals. Around 380 BC, he wrote an important essay on hunting and hunting dogs. The tract gives one a rare glimpse into the breeding and training of Greek hunting dogs, describing in detail how to both identify, breed, and train a superior hound. The aristocratic interest and practice of breeding beginning with livestock but also horses, dogs, and other animals, ends up informing their politics. In other words, aristocratic government can be understood quite literally as a breeding regime. The purpose of this regime is to produce virtue, more precisely, physical virtue, rather than moral or intellectual virtue. Aristocratic traditions such as hunting, dancing, and training in the gymnasium are considered virtuous because they enable one to develop warlike qualities. By embracing a strict diet and a physical training regimen, generation after generation, the family preserves and strengthens their stock or lineage. The inherent physicality of ancient Greek aristocracy, its orientation towards action and war, is reflected in art. Greek art begins in the late 7th century BC with the archaic kouros, 
a more than life-sized nude statue of a victorious athlete. In ancient Greek, Kouros means youth, boy, especially of noble rank. For 300 years, Greek sculpture revolved around the Kouros. This style of sculpture could only appear in a culture obsessed with physical and athletic development. Nietzsche believes that high culture is rooted in the aristocratic way of life. To quote him, every enhancement in the type man up to this point has been the work of an aristocratic society, and that's how it will always be, over and over again. High culture begins with the cultivation of human nature. This should be understood as the literal cultivation of physical fitness. Physical fitness serves as both the inspiration and source of creative impulses. Greek sculpture begins, as has already been noted, with a life-sized nude statue of a victorious athlete. The athletic body was, therefore, the inspiration for Greek art. Likewise, Nietzsche claims that physical culture was the inspiration for philosophy. To quote him, there would be no platonic philosophy at all if there were not such beautiful youths in Athens. It is only their side that transposes the philosopher's soul into an erotic trance, leaving it no peace until it lowers the seed of all exalted things into such beautiful soil. Philosophy, after the fashion of Plato, might rather be defined as an erotic contest, as a further development and turning inward of the ancient agonistic gymnastics and of its presuppositions. What ultimately grew out of this philosophic eroticism of Plato, a new art form of the Greek agon, dialectics. In other words, physical beauty is the source of both Greek philosophy and sculpture. The careful, centuries-long breeding project results in physical beauty, which in turn inspires high culture. Not only does physical virtue inspire art, it is the source of art. To quote Nietzsche once again, culture should begin in the right place, not in the soul, as was the fateful superstition of the priests and half-priests. The right place is the body, the gesture, the diet, physiology. The rest follows from that. Therefore, the Greeks remained the first cultural event in history. They knew, they did, what was needed. And Christianity, which despised the body, has been the greatest misfortune of humanity so far. The link that Nietzsche makes between aristocracy and high culture seems justified when one looks at ancient Athens. It does not, however, appear to be a universal rule. Indeed, many aristocratic cultures appear to produce nothing of cultural worth. One only needs to look at Sparta to illustrate this point. In many ways, Sparta was the aristocratic regime par excellence. The Spartans were a northern people who conquered the southeast of the Peloponnesus. They reduced the native population to the condition of serfs, who they called helots. In historical times, all the land belonged to the Spartans, who were, however, forbidden by law and custom to cultivate it themselves, both on the ground that such labour was degrading and in order that they might always be free for military service. Instead, it was cultivated by the subject population. Bertrand Russell describes life in Sparta as follows. The sole business of a Spartan citizen was war, to which he was trained from birth. Sickly children were exposed after inspection by the heads of the tribe. Only those judged vigorous were allowed to be reared. Up to the age of 20, all the boys were trained in one big school. The purpose of the school was to make them hardy, indifferent to pain, and submissive to discipline. There was no nonsense about cultural or scientific education. The sole aim was to produce good soldiers, wholly devoted to the state. In other words, everything was sacrificed to success in war, including culture. Sparta produced a race of almost invincible warriors, but it made almost no contribution to civilization. Likewise, Rome was an aristocratic culture that is mainly known for technical, social, and military accomplishments rather than cultural ones. They created aqueducts, concrete, a highly sophisticated network of roads, and the largest empire the world had ever seen, but their cultural achievements were largely Greek imitations. To quote Nietzsche, A state that cannot attain its ultimate goal usually swells to an unnaturally large size. The worldwide empire of the Romans is nothing sublime when compared to Athens. 
the strength that really should go into the flower here remains in the leaves and stem, which flourish. In other words, the aristocratic culture provides the foundation from which high culture flowers. But aristocracy is only the leaves and stem, and not the flower. In other words, aristocracy is a prerequisite for high culture, but not sufficient. According to Nietzsche, culture can only flower during a time of aristocratic decline. Nietzsche believes that high culture occurs when an aristocratic regime is in a state of decline. To quote him, All great ages of culture are ages of political decline. What is great culturally has always been unpolitical, even anti-political. As has already been said, the aristocratic regime is originally intended for conquest and self-defense. Through training, diet, and breeding, aristocrats cultivate their strength and martial prowess. They develop immense power over the course of generations for the sake of war alone. This power begins to flow in a different direction during a time of political decline. Nietzsche calls these periods fortunate times. To quote him, At some point, a fortunate time arises, which lets the immense tension ease. Perhaps there are no more enemies among the neighbors, and the means for living, even for enjoying life, are there in abundance. In other words, the security of the polis leads to a relaxation of political pressures. Aristocrats can abandon their strict training regimes and focus instead on cultural pursuits. This point is perhaps best demonstrated by ancient Athens. Attica at the beginning of the historical period was a self-supporting little agricultural region. Athens, its capital, was not large but contained a growing population of artisans. The government was in the hands of an aristocracy who oppressed both the country farmers and the urban artisans. This little agricultural region successfully defeated a military superpower. In 490 BC, the Athenians defeated the Persian king Darius. Ten years later, they defeated his son and successor, Xerxes. Following the Persian Wars, the Greek statesman Pericles profoundly reshaped Athens. He toppled the aristocratic council of Athens in favour of a more democratic system. The age of Pericles was one of those fortunate times that Nietzsche described. The wealth and military dominance of Athens, combined with the liberalisation and democratisation of its politics, relaxed the pressures on the aristocracy. This enabled the immense power developed over the course of generations to be redirected towards cultural pursuits. The playwrights, Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides, all lived and worked during this time, as did the historians Herodotus and Thucydides, and the physician Hippocrates, as well as the philosophers Plato and Socrates. Until this point, Athens had produced no great men in art or literature, but had been devoted instead to the production of military genius. Suddenly, under the stimulus of victory, wealth, and liberalization, architects, sculptors, and dramatists, who remain unsurpassed to the present day, produce works which dominated the future down to modern times. To quote Bertrand Russell once again, The achievements of Athens in the time of Pericles are perhaps the most astonishing thing in all history. This is the most surprising when we consider the smallness of the population involved. Athens, at its maximum, about 430 BC, is estimated to have numbered about 230,000 people, including slaves. And the surrounding territory of rural Attica probably contained a rather smaller population. Never before or since has anything approaching the same proportion of the inhabitants of any area shown itself capable of work of the highest excellence. This was, nevertheless, an age of decadence and dissolution. The Greek aristocracy's preoccupation with culture ultimately led to the neglect of military matters. Towards the end of this century, democratic Athens would lose a war against the oligarchic Spartans, who established the, an occupational government in Athens known as the Thirty Tyrants. This was the environment that both Plato and Socrates lived in. They were philosophizing whilst the Greek Empire was falling. Socrates taught the men around him to criticize everything, including Athenian democracy. As a consequence, philosophy came to be considered an anti-democratic activity. Some went so far to associate it with tyranny. This association does not appear totally unfounded. One of the 30 tyrants installed by Sparta was a student of Socrates. Socrates was just one philosopher among many to be put to death by the democratic regime. This event was not isolated. Indeed, 
Other philosophers, such as Anaxagoras, Protagoras, and even Aristotle, were persecuted by the democratic regime. The demos came to believe that philosophy undermined convention and custom, and thereby public morality. In other words, the citizens of Athens came to believe that philosophy and democracy were incompatible. Thus, they persecuted philosophers. Plato believes the fall of the Greek Empire and the execution of Socrates can both be attributed to the political values of Athenian democracy. The decline of aristocratic political institutions led to the Spartan victory and the persecution of the greatest man of Greek culture, namely Socrates. Plato believed that the only remedy for philosophical persecution and Greek decadence was the revival of aristocracy. The aristocratic state that Plato idealized was composed of three caste-like parts. The first part was the ruling class, made up of the philosopher kings. The second part was the auxiliaries of the ruling caste, made up of soldiers. And the third and final caste was the majority of people. Plato believed an aristocracy centered around the philosopher king would cure Greek decadence and make the world safe for philosophy. Nietzsche's historical context was, in many ways, like Plato's. Aristocracy throughout Europe was in a state of decline and decay. The democratic, republican spirit of the French Revolution had left a permanent imprint on the continent. Four years after Nietzsche's birth, the revolutionary upheavals of 1848 swept across Europe. France again turned republican, and universal and unrestricted suffrage for all male citizens above the age of 21 was introduced. Likewise, in Prussia, democratization set in with the Revolution of 1848 and the Constitution of 1850. The lower chamber of the Prussian Parliament was hence elected by universal male suffrage. Franchise was similarly expanded in Austria, Italy and the United Kingdom. During Nietzsche's time, the aristocratic political institutions were being diminished everywhere. He witnessed the birth of democracy in Germany and was a privileged observer of the general transition to democracy that took place across Europe in the later part of the 19th century. Nietzsche believed that the democratizing trend sweeping over Europe would ultimately lead to a great leveling of its culture. He feared that the state, instead of focusing on the production of genius and high culture, would instead focus on the masses. All its energy would be devoted to bringing about the greatest good for the greatest number. In Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche argues that the democratic movement is not merely an abased form of political organization, but rather an abased, more specifically diminished, form of humanity, a mediocratization and depreciation of humanity in value. In other words, Nietzsche believed that democracy would lead to a general enfeeblement of European man and culture. The emphasis on equality and the masses would lead to a mediocre culture incapable of producing anything or anyone of value. As has already been said, Nietzsche believes that life can only be justified as an aesthetic phenomenon. Thus, when culture stagnates, people begin to experience their lives as meaningless. Nietzsche believes democracy is incapable of producing anything of cultural worth, and thus, democratic citizens begin to experience life as meaningless. The emphasis on things like equality, progress, the dignity of man and the dignity of work ring hollow because what people really need, as the Greeks had understood, is to serve something greater than themselves. In other words, they need a new aristocracy. Nietzsche believes this demand for a new cultural aristocracy will be inevitable as it rises from a universal need to have one's life aesthetically justified. To quote Nietzsche, future Europeans will be exceedingly garrulous, impotent, and eminently employable workers who will feel the need for masters and commanders like they need their daily bread. The democratization of Europe, in effect, amounts to the creation of a type prepared for slavery. Plato wanted to overthrow his contemporary polis and found a new state. This new state would be aristocratic and centered around a philosopher king. Nietzsche, in many ways, agrees with Plato's politics. Like Plato, he believed that democracy is an abased form of government that must be replaced by aristocracy. He does not, however, believe this new aristocracy should consist of philosophers. This is because he believes philosophy is incapable of addressing pathology. To quote him, Where could we find an instance of cultural pathology that philosophy restored to health? 
If a culture is sick, Nietzsche believes philosophy will make it even sicker. Instead, Nietzsche believes we must return to the roots of aristocracy, namely physical strength. The problem with egalitarian and democratic cultures is that they end up breeding weakness. If you wish to restore the vitality of a culture, you must focus on human material. In other words, you must focus on the body. To quote Nietzsche, diet, locality, climate, and one's mode of recreation are inconceivably more important than all which has hitherto been held in high esteem. It is precisely in this quarter that we must begin to learn afresh. All those things which mankind has valued with such earnestness heretofore are not even real. They are mere creations of fancy, or, more strictly speaking, lies born of evil instincts of diseased and, in the deepest sense, noxious natures. All the concepts, God, soul, virtue, sin, beyond, truth, eternal life, but the greatness of human nature, its divinity, was sought for in them. All questions of politics, of social order, of education, have been falsified, root and branch, owing to the fact that the most noxious men have been taken for great men, and that people were taught to despise the small things, or rather the fundamental things of life. In other words, the raw material for high culture is furnished by a physical and dietary training regimen. The restoration of cultural vitality depends on the restoration of physical vitality. To quote Nietzsche one last time, culture should begin in the right place, not in the soul, as was the fateful superstition of the priests and half-priests. The right place is the body, the gesture, the diet, physiology, the rest follows from that. The link that Nietzsche makes between physical fitness and high culture will sound absurd to modern ears. The West has come to view the mind as somehow separate from the body. In fact, some go so far to view the development of the body as antagonistic to the development of the mind. This idea is reflected in the bourgeois attitude towards bodybuilding. But mind-body dualism is a fiction. The body profoundly influences the direction and quality of the mind, and by extension, it profoundly influences the quality and content of a culture. The two chief epochs of European culture, Greek antiquity and the Italian Renaissance, were dominated by the sculpture of nude athletes. The fluid, moving sculpture of the athletic body was captured in imperishable marble, and till this day, these sculptures are considered some of the greatest achievements of European civilization. For those who still doubt the link between high culture and physical fitness, I leave you with a question. Is it a coincidence that the culture that invented philosophy, drama, and science also invented the Olympics? Thanks for watching.